Hello and let's talk about the 45th anniversary of the emergency. On June 25th, 1975, at around 11 p.m., President Fakhruddin Ali Ahmed signed the proclamation of internal emergency, citing the threat to security of India from internal disturbances. This marked the beginning of a brutal chapter of Indian history, which showed both the fragility of our institutions and the need to fight to strengthen them. The major pillars of our democracy crumbled one by one, with a few exceptions before the authoritarian will of Indira Gandhi. Many fundamental rights were suspended. The Draconian Maintenance of Internal Security Act, or MISA, was used indiscriminately to target any opponent to the government. Opposition state governments were dismissed, and leaders of opposition parties were jailed, as were tens of thousands of common people. The press, which was supposed to be a defender of democracy, was censored. But what was worse was the fact that many media organizations willingly accepted the censorship. The Supreme Court of India forever damaged its reputation when it agreed with the government that during the emergency, fundamental rights were not available to citizens and habeas corpus pleas were not valid during this period. An important thing to remember is that the majority of the victims were the poor, the working people of the country. These were the people who were forcibly evicted from slums, who were sterilized, who faced a sustained assault from a government of their own. If any of the above seems familiar to you today, it's not surprising. The past few years have seen many commentators draw parallels between the situation then and what is happening now. We don't have an official emergency in place, but what we do see is that the same institutional collapse is happening at an accelerated rate. The same crackdown on critics of the government, the same unquestioning submission to authority. We talked to News Clicks Prabir Purkayastha on this issue. Prabir was one of those detained during this period as a student leader. Here's what he had to say. Uh, Prabir, thank you so much for joining us. So, uh, like we just mentioned, it's the 45th anniversary of the emergency. There's been a lot of discussion about it, opinion pieces, of course. But more importantly, a lot of commentators, both now and over the past few years, have been drawing certain parallels. And one of the key aspects that has been talked about is the collapse of institutions itself. Now, there have been misguided and even malicious policies by governments before. But we are probably in a phase where the ability of the pillars of Indian democracy or the willingness of those pillars to resist this kind of attacks seems to have come down to an all-time low. So we'll talk a bit about that, especially keeping the emergency in context. You know, let's take the comparison that is quite often being made. This is a super emergency and that was the emergency. Now, if we leave the, uh, shall we say, all these adjectives out, we had one kind of emergency then, we have a different kind of emergency now. I think the common issue is not so much the collapse of the institutions or the collapse of the media, as people are making it out to be, but the fact that it is very difficult to resist during COVID-19 epidemic with all the laws put, that have been put in place. And I'm really referring to the Disaster Management Act, which as you know, is a draconian piece of legislation meant for very uh, extreme times when you have an epidemic. This is really after the bubonic plague of the 1920s, 30s, when you really had serious, serious case of bubonic plague. We are really seeing again another epidemic of this order. So this obviously is a draconian act because it's meant to control uh, emergencies of certain kinds. So that's a legal instrument which is in place. Uh, we also have the epidemic acts, which give the state governments a lot of power. But for the central government, that's not the main instrument that is being used right now. And they have used, in fact, the Disaster Management Act to pull up district magistrates who have obeyed state orders. So that, that kind of institutional mechanism is one which is already there. The second collapse is basically because, again, of the epidemic. We are not able to mobilize people on the streets. We don't want to right now. Though, if you see what's happened in the United States, the people coming into the streets of protest have not really increased the numbers. And that's one of the reasons is that this epidemic seems to affect people much more in confined spaces. So given that, uh, it's, it's good to know that, you know, uh, mass demonstrations on the roads do not lead to immediately spiraling up, spiraling up of numbers. Right. But nevertheless, it is true that this is not the time that we ask people to come out in large numbers due to various reasons, mainly because of the nature of the epidemic itself. So resistance in that sense is now confined more to social media, 
private discourse rather than public resistance, which is a normal political uh, time resistance. And normal politics means you, of course, mobilize, you get people on the streets. The temper of the people also give a pause to both the institutions and the rulers. So I think the dynamic of the institution uh, being weak is not so much only of the interaction between the rulers and the institutions of democracy, as you called it, the court being, of course, a key one in that. that it is really also the pressure of those who are ruled to mm -hmm. fight back. And if that fight back is weakened, due to whatever reasons, then, of course, there is a problem that the institutions then get into, that they then start succumbing slowly. Uh, one by one, they seem to fall by the wayside, which is what the Supreme Court at the moment is perhaps most uh, glaringly doing. It says all the right things about law, but then it doesn't provide relief to the people. So exactly. given that you have an institutional failure of the court, that even in the famous emergency judgment, which is what's called the ADM Jabalpur judgment, the court said, yes, people, the detainees have the right to life and liberty, since I was a litigant in that same petition. So the, you have a right to life and liberty, but you cannot exercise this juridically. That means the court cannot give you a relief that you are seeking for. So the essential part is not recognizing the law, what is right under law, what is right and what is wrong, but being able to provide relief to the petitioners. And that's exactly what we see today, whether it's Kashmir, whether it's other cases. The court says all the right things about law, but what is missing is giving relief. So this is one part of the really the issue. So I will say that the institutional collapse is a consequence of the emergency architecture, which is the Disaster Management Act, and the fact that mass resistance has become more difficult under epidemic times. And the government in that sense has got a window of opportunity where it can do a whole bunch of things, including changes in labor laws by fiat, not by changing the law, but by fiat and saying, OK, because if it's an epidemic, we say unions cannot do ABC. You cannot go on strike. We can sack you whenever we want. The labor courts will not interfere. Now, these are all actually diktats of the government not backed up by any legal infrastructure. The court is unwilling to provide relief. People are not able to resist because the factories, half of them not even working. So given all of this, you have a situation, the normal avenues of protest don't exist. And then you have what you are calling off as the institutional collapse right. that's taking place. It's not the intent of the rulers ever to give you democracy. Absolutely. You retain democracy as a consequence of your ability to resist undemocratic measures, authoritarian measures. So that, I think, is the bigger issue for me. Right. And the other key aspect I also wanted to talk about was the regarding the role of the political opposition and state governments itself. Now, during that point of time, president's rule was the preferred way of getting rid of inconvenient state governments. But now what we see is that even with restrictions on how president's rule can be used, the idea of opposition, the political opposition itself is slowly being neutralized by financial strangulation of the state governments on the one hand. Then there is a mass defections that are being engineered in almost every state. So we see that we, there's also very strong uh, say assault on the federal structure through these processes. Yes, the federal structure has been affected in a number of ways. And as you have pointed out, the finance is the key issue. They're not even getting what is their due under GST disbursement, which should have taken place much earlier, not for funds which have now been constrained because of the lack of a lower tax revenue, but taxes which are collected in an earlier period. Even those disbursements are not being made to the states. The states cannot borrow unlike the central government, which can actually print the money, what is called helicopter money in today's language. The states cannot do that. It is also hamstring by how much it can borrow because that's the central uh, permission it needs to seek. Of course, they've been allowed to bury, borrow more, but borrowing more also has consequences for them. So all the fiscal transfers which needs to be made are not being made. The, the share of the state government's finances which are due to them are not being given to them. And then you have also all the so-called 20 lakh crore 
plans that you have or which you are now saying you are doing, most of it is either imaginary, past schemes being sort of refurbished, uh, if you will, or whitewashed to present as if they are new. And plus, a lot of them are actually just loans. They are promise of loans, not even loans. And most of the transfers uh, of, of there are to big capital, not to the state governments. Whatever the state government is spending even on emergency health measures, only a small proportion of that is going to the states. And the total health transfers are 15,000 crores, about 7,800 crores for this year, the rest for new year. Uh, and the total share of the state out of this 20 lakh crore amount is only 3,000 crores. So given all of this, states have been really hamstrung. And if the protest, the currently, the issue that is still there is if the protest, there is still the issue that the, the, the central government holds by fiat, overrules whatever it wants to do, and can say, no, no, you have to follow this. And as you said, there is a democracy sort of, uh, of course, dismissal that can also be used. But you also pointed out that buying and selling of MLAs for both the, uh, the higher, uh, the, this upper house, which is Rajya Sabha, that has been going on. You have buying and selling of MLAs for overturning uh, governments which was what was exercised in Madhya Pradesh, for example. So you have various other uh, processes that, were, uh, that are going on simultaneously, which does not seem to have been constrained by uh, the epidemic. So you have this opposition's ability to resist is curtailed, but the buying and selling by the central, uh, the power that holds the central government today, the political party that holds the central government, the right. BJP, that does not seem to be constrained in terms of buying MLAs and, MA and MPs, maybe at some point, and trying to therefore uh, up, up overthrow state governments or save its government again by horse uh, dealing of different kinds. So none of that seems to have stopped. Right. And finally, Prabir, so the other aspect which was commented on widely during that period was the role of the media about how client they were, how, with some exceptions, of course, how they surrendered to the government way of doing things, the government narrative around it. So how do we see the situation today? Again, like as like we've discussed, there's no official censorship, but the amount of the volume of content that furthers the government cause seems more than ever before. Yeah, Advani had a very telling phrase, the media crawled where it was asked to bend. And uh, I'm, I'm I have to say that the current generation of media hasn't fallen that that far. You know, it's still printing stories, it's giving views. There is that part of it. Yes, there are compromises it clearly is making. Certain stories don't come. Certain comments are very, very uh, muted, shall we say. Certain views are over portrayed in the media. All that is true. But nevertheless, there are critical stories to give some amount of balance and not make it completely as one-sided as it was during the emergency, but the media completely caved in. That's one part of it. The second part of it is today the instrument of, shall we say, building up an opinion of a certain kind is not only policing the media, which is what was there earlier, but it is also creating a whole bunch of what I will call troll media or uh, whatever other media you want to call, the so using the social media platforms, basically attacking anybody who dares to uh, be critical about the Modi government. So this is, this is the uh, voice that is sought to be raised. And there are a huge number of television channels as well as certain newspapers and digital platforms which are willing to abet the government on this or basically partner in this venture. So this is the new... Uh, normal, shall we say, where trolling is considered news and news can be then proceeded against under first, first information reports filed by either people who, are, uh, who follow the lawfare model, attack people legally by filing cases or by the government itself by filing FIR. So you have a whole range of now instruments like this being used. If you see, for instance, the case against Vinod Duo, a leading journalist and a long-time television anchor, or against 
Supriya, who's in scroll, what's been done in scroll, or Siddharth Varadaraj, the editor of Wire, you will see that this is the pattern being followed. There are FIRs being filed by the police. There are then, again, cases being filed by other people. And then it's a case of harassing and hoping, therefore, that this provides a chilling effect for the rest of the media. And I'm, I must say that some of it really works because most people would not like under current conditions to go to jail. And with the COVID-19 hanging as a sort of democles on everybody's hands, and this is true for also those who've been now put in jail in the Bhima Koregao case, the, that COVID-19 becomes then a further threat apart from the normal threat of jail. Because as you know, jails are crowded and therefore social distancing is not possible. And if there is an infection in the jails, it's very likely to spread fast. This is what we saw in various other places uh, where infections did take place in the jails. So I think that's the other threat that's being held out both directly and indirectly to the media and particularly the, to the digital platforms which have mushroomed in the last five, six years and play a very important role today, including media uh, platforms like Newsclip. Thank you, Prabhu, for talking to us. In our next segment, we continue the conversation that we showed yesterday with Brazilian social leader Jesse Diani. In this segment, she talks about the project that President Jair Bolsonaro, a right-wing leader, is building in Brazil. É, também, hoje, o Brasil vive não só uma crise de saúde pública, bem grave, mas também uma crise política. Então, o que você pode dizer sobre a atual crise política? Quais são as expectativas sobre o possível impeachment de Bolsonaro? Também, obviamente, isso tem que ver muito com a administração do, do coronavírus mesmo. Então... É, o Brasil ele já vivia uma crise política né, antes da pandemia, mas é, a crise sanitária e o coronavírus fez com que, e essa postura negacionista da doença por parte de Bolsonaro aprofundou a crise política, porque muitos governadores, a maioria dos governadores do Brasil, dos estados, se posicionam, é, dos, todos, na verdade, se posicionam no sentido de que essa postura do governo federal está equivocada. Né? Nem todos se colocam na oposição frontal ao governo, mas a grande maioria, sim, e todos, sem exceção, têm uma postura de reconhecer que a pandemia é real, que isso não é uma invenção e que isso mata, né? e que isso vai ter um impacto muito grave na população. Então, a maioria dos governadores tem uma posição de respeitar as medidas da OMS e tentar desenvolver medidas para conter a epidemia. E isso agravou a crise política e gerou um acirramento muito forte entre, entre o próprio poder público. Né? Então, tanto os governadores têm tido essa, essa postura, quanto a parcela do judiciário tem se posicionado muito também nesse sentido de oh, é, isso não está certo, estão, isso é, é um crime né, contra a nação, Você tá colocando, o presidente está colocando o povo para morrer, né? Então, uma das hashtags, inclusive, é, aqui contra o governo Bolsonaro é Bolsonaro genocida, porque é um projeto que, de fato, é, mata o povo brasileiro, né? Então, tudo começou a se aprofundar com a crise sanitária. Então, uma acirra crise política, a profunda crise política, e gera um grande movimento de oposição ao governo por conta dessa postura. Soma-se a isso o fato de que o Bolsonaro, além de ter essa postura negacionista, anti-ciência, anti-razão, é, ele também, desde sempre, nunca escondeu, nunca negou, defende projetos autoritários. Então, desde quando ele era deputado federal, ele já fazia homenagens a torturadores da ditadura militar aqui no Brasil. Ele nunca escondeu o seu, seu projeto autoritário. Só que, enquanto presidente da República, ele estava mais ou menos contido, digamos, né, durante um período. E, a partir dessa, desse aprofundamento da crise política, as sanhas e a, o seu projeto autoritário começaram a aparecer com mais força. Começaram a acontecer várias manifestações de rua, pedindo intervenção militar, fechamento do Congresso Nacional, fechamento do STF, que são coisas que só aconteceram na ditadura aqui no Brasil, e o, o presidente Bolsonaro participou dessas manifestações, inclusive sem usar máscara, passando bem essa mensagem de que é, essa é uma gripezinha e que essa doença não precisa nada desse negócio de usar máscara, de usar álcool em gel e de né, garantir as medidas aí de distanciamento social necessárias para conter o coronavírus. Outro elemento importante foi a, a divulgação do vídeo da reunião ministerial, né, que o, o Judiciário do Brasil autorizou. 
Quando esse vídeo foi divulgado, também ficou muito evidente como não só o Bolsonaro, mas também os seus ministros compactuam com esse projeto autoritário de fechamento do regime democrático no país com um caráter neofascista. Então, é muito importante a gente demarcar e deixar isso muito explícito. O Bolsonaro é um líder fascista no Brasil e os seus ministros pactuam com esse projeto. Né? Essa reunião ministerial revelou o, 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 a vontade de Bolsonaro e a existência de uma base armada na sociedade, disposta a tudo e qualquer coisa, a matar e aí até os, as últimas consequências para defender o Bolsonaro enquanto esse líder né, dessa, dessa legião, é, independente das suas contradições, inclusive. Né? Um elemento interessante da gente observar é que quando essa, essa crise se acirra, o governo Bolsonaro, o Bolsonaro né, enquanto presidente, faz um movimento de se aliar com o um centrão no Congresso Nacional, com o objetivo de evitar a abertura dos mais de 30 pedidos de impeachment que existem hoje é, lá na casa. E quando ele faz esse movimento, ele é extremamente contraditório com o seu discurso, porque Bolsonaro nas eleições era não vou negociar, acabou a mamata, é, acabou o tomar lá da cá, e ele sempre negou esse processo de conformação de blocos, alianças e tal, né, no Congresso, para garantir os interesses do governo. Então, ele faz esse movimento, mas mesmo assim, a base bolsonarista é aquela base siga o líder. É uma base que é mais uma característica também desse caráter neofascista é, do Bolsonaro e da sua base bolsonarista. Né? Então, é, esses elementos agregaram um novo elemento de oposição, de um movimento de oposição. Então, além da negação à a, a pandemia, também tem esse elemento da defesa da democracia. Então, diversos governadores também do país, o judiciário, a mídia, né, começaram, além da oposição da esquerda, que historicamente, e antes de tudo isso acontecer, já estava se posicionando contra esse governo, então, para nós, da esquerda, isso não é novidade, a gente já sabia que isso era Bolsonaro, mas digamos que outros setores, que inclusive apoiaram é, Bolsonaro chegar onde ele chegou, hoje olham e fazem, não, isso não dá. Negar a pandemia não dá e atacar as instituições democráticas também não dá. Então, isso começou a fazer com que um movimento de oposição mais amplo do que a esquerda brasileira passasse a, é, a defender o impeachment, defender o impedimento do governo Bolsonaro, por dois motivos. Sem impedir o governo Bolsonaro, o nosso povo vai morrer, porque ele nega a pandemia, ele lança o povo à morte, e por outro motivo, não vai restar a democracia no Brasil se Bolsonaro continuar como presidente, isso já está muito evidente. É, então, diante disso, muitos pedidos foram apresentados, já tem mais de 30 pedidos é, de impeachment, agora, se o pedido de impeachment será aceito, aberto, se esse processo vai, é, vai de fato, né, se desdobrar no impedimento do presidente, aí existem questões que ainda estão no jogo, o jogo ainda está sendo jogado, né, um elemento é que Bolsonaro cresceu muito desgaste na sociedade, mas é, ele mantém uma base social estável, de mais ou menos 30% de apoio na sociedade. E isso, é, nenhum presidente do Brasil nunca foi impeachmentado com, com essa base de apoio. Então, esse é um elemento. O segundo elemento é que ele fez essa aliança com o Centrão, que, é, do ponto de vista dos votos, impede que um processo de impeachment hoje seja aberto. Mas os, os elementos favoráveis, digamos, é que se explodiram mobilizações de rua no Brasil contra o fascismo e contra o racismo, e isso aumentou a pressão contra o governo. É, existem os setores governadores, mídia, judiciário e a esquerda brasileira com muita força né, nesse movimento de impedimento do presidente. E existe uma grave crise social que será determinante para esse processo avançar ou não. Então, para vocês terem uma noção, aqui no Brasil, a gente tem, saiu um dado agora do IBGE, que a gente está numa marca de 10,9 milhões de desempregados. Só que esse dado de desempregados, ele considera as pessoas que estão sem ocupação e estão procurando emprego. Não considera o dado das pessoas que não estão buscando emprego, seja pelo isolamento social, seja porque, no caso das mulheres, por exemplo, com a pandemia, com o isolamento, é, aumentou muito as tarefas domésticas e as mulheres têm que ficar com as crianças, cuidar da casa, etc., e não estão buscando emprego. Então, tem uma... Ou, 
o outro elemento são as pessoas que já estão tão desiludidas de que falta emprego no Brasil, que não estão procurando também por esse motivo. Mas se a gente for olhar o total de número de pessoas que estão sem emprego no Brasil, chega a 75 milhões, dentre as pessoas que estão procurando, dentre as pessoas que não estão procurando. Isso significa 41% da população. É muita gente desempregada. E esse, esses dados, eles podem agravar a crise social a tal ponto que faça com que esses 30%, essa correlação de forças que ainda não virou completamente, se aprofunde ainda mais na oposição ao governo, ao governo somado com essas forças políticas que já estão posicionadas, como é a grande parcela do judiciário, como é, é os governadores, a esquerda, enfim, parte ali do Congresso Nacional e a mídia. Agora, um outro elemento importante também que a gente tem que considerar é que além dessa base estável de 30%, e dessa aliança pontual com o Centrão, o Bolsonaro também tem o apoio de parcela das Forças Armadas, e o apoio das polícias militares nos estados. Então, é uma situação extremamente complexa no Brasil, não é um, um, um jogo simples de ser jogado, é complexo, é difícil, mas nós seguimos no esforço de conscientização e disputa da sociedade para que as pessoas compreendam que é só impedindo o Bolsonaro que nós teremos democracia e vida no nosso país, podemos preservar a vida de milhões de brasileiros, seja do coronavírus, seja do fascismo, seja das balas racistas que estão matando as pessoas pretas e pobres na periferia todos os dias, inclusive dentro de casa, pessoas inocentes, né, sendo mortas de forma muito truculenta pela polícia militar. Então, tudo isso está é, em disputa, mas o que eu posso dizer é que, do ponto de vista da, dos setores políticos, muitos estão a favor do impeachment e, do ponto de vista da sociedade, o desgaste só aumenta. Então, é possível é, o impeachment no Brasil e a gente está empurrando o bloco nesse sentido para conseguir impedir o presidente. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with major news developments from the country. Until then, keep watching NewsClick. Thank <laughs> you.